you this morning. I wasn't planning to say this, but um, I'm an Oregon duck. But I hold no resentment towards Auburn for a football game a couple years ago. Just want you to know that. Have you ever thought to yourself or maybe gotten even braver and said out loud to someone else, what in the world is he thinking? What in the world is she thinking? Well, 95% of us have thought that, and the other 5% are liars. So we've all been there. Um, but it's a little harder to say that about God Almighty, isn't it? Or even to think about that relative to God Almighty, but yet sometimes we do. It's not a family secret. Um, a number of years ago, we got a call from our son who lives in Oregon about our daughter who at the time was living in Denver, and it turns out that uh, she had become addicted to drugs. And out of that came a ministry that uh, helped a lot of people and helped a lot of pastors and Christian workers. And at the first conference we had, one of our speakers, whose son is still on drugs, began her talk by saying, through this process, I've learned that he is God and I am not. Now, I knew that. I've known that for a long time, but I'd never put those words together. He is God and I am not. But if we can recognize the truth of that statement, that he is God and we're not God, then it's easier for us to accept what he's doing when we don't understand what he's doing. Earlier this morning, I was reading a, a book by Norm, um, I, I, I actually forget his last name for a second, it'll come to me, but he said in the book, um, um, I've completely forgotten his name, so uh, ducks forget a lot of things because we live under the water much of the time. So um, <laughs> he said that God often is silent when we wish he would speak, and he speaks when we wish he was silent. So the whole question then is, how do we learn to trust God when he's not moving in the direction or in the way in which we wish he would be moving? But I would suggest to you this morning that uh, God knows that bad times are going to come into our lives. They're going to come in different ways. Uh, what might be a bad way for me won't be a bad way for you. What might be a bad way for you won't be a bad way for me. <clears throat> but we all experience those bad times. And I think a verse that helps us accept that and helps us deal with that is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Peter says, uh, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he will exalt you at the proper time casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Now, we understand that we should humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, but sometimes it's difficult to do that. And it's difficult to trust God that he will exalt us at the proper time, but the proper time is his timing, not our timing. But I think it's even more difficult to cast all of our anxieties on him uh, even though we understand that he cares for us. And here are some thoughts that I have as to why it is so difficult for us to uh, have a hard time admitting that we're anxious or that we have anxieties, why it's difficult to admit it to God and it's difficult to admit it to other people. One is just a lack of honesty. Some of the hardest words to say in the English language are, I was wrong, I am wrong difficult words to speak. I was wrong. I am wrong. I don't know how we would categorize all the words of Jesus Christ and say that some are more profound than other words, but uh, I think some of the most profound words that Jesus ever spoke and that are as alive and as relevant and as profound today as they were 2,000 years ago is when he said, take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck of dust out of your brother's eye. And let's be realistic. It's much more fun for me 
to think about and talk about your imperfections than it is for me to talk about my imperfections. It's much more fun for you to think about and talk about my imperfections than it is to think about your own imperfections. A number of years ago, he's now deceased, an evangelist over in, in Atlanta, out of Atlanta, John Haggai, wrote a book called How to Win Over Worry. And in the book, he said, the more time we can spend thinking about the, anxiety, about the inconsistencies and the sins in other people's lives, the less time we have to think about the inconsistencies and the sins in our own lives. So it's just a lack of honesty sometimes to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that I am anxious about something and there are anxieties in my life. Um, also, it, it's a lack of maturity. Uh, we know that Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, just take care of today, tomorrow will take care of itself. And, and yet we, we don't live that all of the time. We don't practice that all the time. But it's hard to admit that we're still in the process of children of God, that we're in the process of learning and growing. An example I use in, in July, July 15th, my wife and I celebrate uh, 49 years of marriage. There's no doubt. I got the better part of the deal by far. You have to think about that for a moment, but I got the better part of the deal. And on July 15th, we're going to do what we've done for 48 years. We're going to go out for dinner. And then we're going to do what we've done the last few years. We're going to share with each other how the other person uh, can be a better spouse over the next year. And so when we get to that part of our evening together, I'm going to pull a little index card out of my pocket and I'll have a couple notes on it and then she's going to reach down to her purse and pull out a legal pad and she'll have what she needs to say to me. Last year the first thing on her list was don't interrupt me so much. First thing on my list was darling let me interrupt you more. Now James says be quick to listen slow to speak. But it wouldn't surprise you at all, would it, that here after, in a, in a few weeks, after 49 years of marriage, we're still learning how to express love to the one that we love the most. I'd rather be with Susan than anyone else. She's the most important person in my life. But I'm still learning how to relate my life to her. I'm still learning how to be humble toward her. I'm still learning how to share my life with her. So why would we be surprised then if we have a difficult time learning how to love the one that's tangible in our lives? As Phil Toole said a few moments ago, God is intangible in that we can't see him or can't touch him. Then doesn't it follow that we're going to be having to learn maturity in our relationship with him? And frankly, sometimes we're just concerned about what other people think of us specifically in the church, and so we don't share that we're anxious about something. We don't share that it seems that, that, that God is being quiet in our lives at this moment. We're not certain how they will respond to us, so we're just quiet. And then frankly, sometimes we just have this sense of lack of Christian support about us. Um, uh, our daughter now goes, in addition to being a, an addiction counselor for the Salvation Army in in Phoenix, where we live, uh, she still goes to Alcoholics Anonymous. And she told me a couple of years ago <clears throat> that the treasurer of their Alcoholics Anonymous club uh, uh, stole all the money. And I was thinking what I would do as a, as a pastor if, if our treasurer stole our money, and I uh, probably shouldn't tell you this morning here in church, but I said, Stephanie, what are you going to do? And she said, well, we're going to invite him back to the club. Where's a better place for an alcoholic to be than with a group of alcoholics who can help him? And by the way, Dad, it was our fault that we didn't have a double signature on the check. And I learned from that, instead of being angry at this person who had stolen their money, they were welcoming him back because that was the best place for him to be as a recovering alcoholic. A couple of years ago, um, my wife Susan and our son Michael um, went on a, a, a river raft run uh, down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. And uh, I was completely out of communication with them. At the end of the time, they took a helicopter out of the canyon, took a small plane back to Page, Arizona. I drove up to get them to uh, drive them home. 
And uh, all I knew is that when I, I pulled up to the airport, they were waiting. And my son came over and he said, when you hug mom, don't hug her too tightly because she's got a sore back. And by the way, I'll drive. I didn't realize this was all a setup deal. And so we get in the car and Susan and I are in the back seat. And he says, I'm thirsty. Are you guys thirsty? Yeah, we're, I'm thirsty, she said. So we stopped to get a Coke. And they begin telling me the story that uh, they had parked their boats to go up a path to see a waterfall, had taken off their life jackets as they were coming back down. He was helping an elderly lady uh, to the boat. And Susan, on this path, stepped on a rock and fell down a 15 embankment uh, into the Colorado River. Now, they were told when they first got into the boats, if you fall in the river, grab your life jacket and get your feet down the river ahead of your, ahead of your head and just wait until somebody finds you. But they had taken their life jackets off. So she fell in the water, but she wasn't thinking clearly. She did exactly what she was told. She reached for her life jacket, but all that was there was her blouse. But another boat had pulled in. Someone saw her in the water. They screamed. That captain of that other boat saw her, put on his life jacket, jumped in the river, and came down the river and got her. But as my son said, Dad, as she went around the bend, I was thinking of jumping in after Mom. I said, did you have a life jacket on? And he said, no. And I said, so I could have lost both of you. Answer is yes. So we drive back to Phoenix. The next morning, I wake up very early, and I laid in bed listening to my wife breathing, realizing that I could have awakened that morning, and there would have been no one in bed with me. So I, I wrote about that, just a little two- or three-page article for myself, <clears throat> but I sent it to a bunch of high school friends, and a number of them emailed back with great compassion about what had happened. But one Christian person wrote back and said, John, buck up. God saved your wife. Get on with your life. No sensitivity at all to what I was thinking. No sensitivity at all to what I was feeling. And the fact is that some of you are thinking, I know that person. I've met them. Because there are some people like that. So sometimes we are reluctant to share our anxiety. We're reluctant to share that we're having a hard time hearing God's voice because it seems as though some people want to beat on us instead of putting their arms around us and walking the path with us. We also need to understand that anxiety often creates a, a doubt about our own spiritual maturity. After all, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Let's take care of today. Tomorrow will take care of itself. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, the Apostle Paul writes, uh, don't be anxious for anything. With prayer and petition, bring your requests made known to God. So that's the standard. Jesus saying don't worry about tomorrow is the standard which we should achieve. Paul saying uh, don't be anxious for anything. That's the standard. But Peter, the Apostle, helps us out by saying Cast all of your anxieties on the Lord because he cares for you. So we have the standard, but when we don't meet the standard, we need to help understand that the Spirit of God helps us through the writings of Peter by saying, cast all of your anxieties on the Lord because he cares for you. But how can I cast my anxieties on the Lord except that I'm honest with them? We sometimes... Uh, 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 realize that anxiety creates in us some doubt our brothers about our brothers and sisters because we're not certain that they will stand with us. So we have to sift through our friendships to understand who it is that is going to stand with us. When it became public that our daughter was addicted to drugs and, and we went to Denver, uh, uh, found her, she came to Phoenix with us and went right into treatment, there were, there were people who shed tears for us put their arms around us and said, let me walk this road with you. There were some other people who tried to pry into our lives to see what kind of parents we've been. I, I got the question, did you take your child to church? Well, I was a pastor. Every time there was a meeting, our kids were there. Did you pray with your kids? Did you do Bible studies with your kids? Instead of showing empathy and sympathy, uh, there was just judgment. And then anxiety sometimes, let's be honest, creates a, a doubt in us about God's trustworthiness. The fact that I doubt God doesn't cause him to have any problems with his own self-image. 
It doesn't affect his, trust, his trustworthiness. It's just that when I'm anxious, I don't know how to trust him. And that's part of the maturation process. The same as Susan and I, mostly me, are still learning how to communicate in marriage after all these years. I was just with a friend the other day in the fall. He lost his wife to uh, liver failure. She was on the, on the waiting list for a liver transplant, but she was too sick to move along the line. And when he told me about his wife dying as this big, strong man, he wept. The other day he said to me, and another, uh, to another Christian brother and, and me, he said, as he wept, he said, my daughter-in-law is mad at God because the baby she just bore never got to meet my wife. He just wept. My daughter-in-law is mad at God because her brand new baby never will get to meet grandmother. And so our prayer that day, as we left one another, to pr was to pray for this young woman that she will understand that God is trustworthy even though she doesn't understand his hand. But we need to recognize that that's what happens when we don't share our anxieties with God. But on the other hand, we need to understand that God is under no obligation to tell us his plan, to what he is doing or why he's doing it. I like the way Bill Hybels says it. Bill Hybels is a pastor of a church up in the Chicago area. Bill says that God speaks at 500 and works at 500 RPMs. We move at 5,000 RPMs. And so we need to slow down, and maybe that's why the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. We need to slow down and still down ourselves so we can hear his voice. Instead of attacking him verbally or mentally and thinking and saying, what in the world is God doing here? We need to think, am I slowing down so I can hear God's voice? And then Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says it so well, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to fill his purpose, fulfill his purpose. And yet sometimes it's so hard to understand that, that God is working in my life even though I don't see it. Or God is working in my life in a way that's painful, uh, but he's working. But he works at his pace, not our pace. Uh, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. We went to high school together. We've known each other. Uh, went to high school in Portland, Oregon. We've known each other since we were 15 years of age. Uh, Diane Goble Myers. She lives in uh, Las Vegas, and um, she's just my hero. Uh, she's married to uh, another man. I'm married to another woman, but I just can't spend enough time with her. My wife absolutely adores her. Here's the story. I heard that this happened, and so I flew over to Las Vegas to uh, see her. Um, a few years ago, she got deathly ill. Her husband, who is now a retired FBI agent, took her to the hospital. They examined her, said, you have kidney stones, here are pain pills, go home, take the pain pills, those kidney stones will pass, everything will be all right in a few days. What the hospital didn't do is call them to tell them that after they left the hospital, they reread the blood tests an hour later and that there was bile in her bloodstream. So two days later, uh, Ron brought her back to the hospital, now deathly ill, almost comatose. And she, in fact, went into a coma that lasted two weeks. One of her sisters, who's a year younger than we are and was in high school with us, told me that she was bleeding from every part of her body, even her eyeballs. And their father anointed her with oil and prayed, God, please don't let my daughter die. When Diane woke up from the coma, you can go to the next picture. Her legs had been amputated mid-calf. Gangrene had set in and they had to take her legs. 
So when she woke up from the coma, she now is missing half of her legs. So I flew over to comfort her, being the minister, and I said to her, Diane, they've ruined your life. Now that'd be a comforting statement, wouldn't it? And she said, oh, honey, we're 57. We're not 27. I've lived a wonderful life. I said, Diane, you'll never dance with Ron again. And she said, oh, honey. I, she didn't even know my name was John. She just called me honey all the time. She said, honey, I got to walk out in the desert with Ron and see a desert tortoise. And that was really special. And I said, Diane, are you going to sue? And she said, oh, honey, people make mistakes. I couldn't get her to say anything bad about anyone. Even though the doctor denied in court that he had seen her. The only time she said anything negative to me, she has been called to Washington to testify before Congress. She was also called to Carson City, the Nevada state capital, to talk about uh, insurance payments. And she said on the plane from Las Vegas up to Car Carson City, I think there were eight do male doctors, and they all were wearing coats and ties, sports coats. When they came into the testimony room, they were all wearing their hospital smocks that doctors wear in the hospital. And the, the state led it, senator who had asked her to come up said, Diane, don't wear pants, which she always does. I want you to wear a skirt so people can see your prosthetics. When she started to testify, these doctors got up and walked out in mass in protest because she was wearing a skirt rather than pants covering up her legs. And she looked at me and said, honey, do you know any doctor who wears their hospital smock outside of the hospital? That's the only negative thing I've heard her say. It, we did a radio interview together on the telephone to a station in Wisconsin. I was at home and she was in Las Vegas and she said this, God did not plan for me for this to happen to me, but God allowed it to happen. And the reason that I say she's my friend is because she has been touched by God in a deeper way than I have. She has learned to trust God in a deeper way than I have. You know, I get a hangnail and I want to take it out on somebody. She's lost her legs. The other day I called because Susan and I are going to be in Las Vegas and we want to see Ron and her. And I said, how are you doing? She said, well, I just fell. I might have cracked a rib. She said, but that happens to amputees. Just as matter-of-factly as I drove to the store to get a carton of milk. She has learned that he is God and that we're not. So I would suggest to you this morning that our ability to trust God starts with Jesus. Think back to Jesus in the garden. He prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done. But before he prayed that, he was wrestling with what was going to happen. He, he was in Jerusalem. He knew how brutal crucifixions were. And he had said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. So he was struggling with the Father's will before he humbled himself to say, but not my will be done, your will be done. So Jesus is not only our teacher at that point, he's also our example to help us understand we can trust God's hand even when we don't understand it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 says, such confidence we have through Christ in God. So our confidence in God starts with Christ as we see how he lived his life here. When I was 10 years old and my cousin was 8 years old, uh, we stole a pack of Camel cigarettes unfiltered from our grandfather and took them out in the woods and smoked as many as we could before we got sick. Uh, last May, my cousin was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. So I went to Portland to see him. He knows he's dying. He has deep faith in Christ. And I walk in the room, he's sitting in this big easy chair, barely functioning, and he said, cousin, 
you know this is your fault that I have cancer. They didn't tell us in seminary what to say to that. I didn't know what to say. I, I, I just stood there. I, I didn't know if he had lost his mind. I, I didn't know what, what to say. Cousin, if you hadn't talked me into stealing grandfather's cigarettes, I wouldn't have cancer today. <laughs> After all these years, knows he's dying, knows he's dying, but he knows where he's going. His sense of humor was still there. He could trust God's hand even in the face of death. And a few weeks later, we buried him. Paul writes in Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if we're anxious today about a loved one, a family member, one of our parents, one of our kids, a friend at work, a colleague at work, and they're down the wrong path, we can think Christ in that person, the hope of glory. When the one we love and they have come to faith in Christ and they have moved away from Christ, we can still pray for them, Christ in John, Christ in Joanne, Christ in Jill, etc. the hope of glory, because our ability to trust God starts with Jesus. Let me leave you with this. God's quietness does not mean that he's not there. It just means that he's working in a way that we don't understand. Sometimes we wish he would speak when he's quiet, and sometimes we wish he would be quiet when he's speaking. But remember, he's God and we're not. And what Peter says is that we have to humble ourselves before God, that he will exalt us at the right time. And therefore, I think we all need to be in the process of learning humility and to depend on him. The other day at our church in Phoenix, I had never heard this song before, but there was a line, I, I wrote it down because I wanted to capture it. And the words in the song go, I am holding on to you because you hold on for me. So let me encourage you. God, the Spirit of God, as he inspired the Word of God, inspired Peter to write, cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The standard is that we would have perfect peace, that we wouldn't worry about tomorrow, as Jesus said. But the fact is that none of us are there yet. So the way we deal with our being anxious and the way we deal with God being quiet and not talking and moving the way we would want him to be is to humble ourselves and cast all our anxieties on him because he cares for us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for his honesty in the garden. That he was struggling with the brutal crucifixion that he was going to experience. I pray that you would help my brothers and sisters this morning. I pray that you would help me, help all of us, to be more honest with you about how we can learn to trust you during those times when we think you're being quiet and when you're not working the way we would want you to work. Lord, we acknowledge there is so much work we need you to do in our lives. And I pray that you would keep working in us, conforming us to the image of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen.